New York City. It is the late 1980s, and David Letterman is at the height of his powers. Everyone wants to know him. David Letterman is one of the United States' most popular television talk show hosts of all time. David Letterman is the longest serving late night talk show host in American history. Over 6,000 episodes of his late night talk show, surpassing even his mentor and hero, Johnny Carson. He's a comedian, he's an entertainer, he's a broadcaster. But one person wants to get closer to Letterman than anyone else. She feels that she is his wife and she has a child by him. This is somebody who is absolutely obsessed with him, fixated on him. Everything in her mind revolves around him. But when fan worship becomes obsessive, things very often get out of hand. She was a big admirer, but it just went way too far. Some people believe that she was actually relishing the attention but that she didn't fully understand the magnitude of what she was doing and how wrong it was. This is the story of David Letterman's stalker and how she tried to get closer to the star and how this celebrity obsession was always going to lead to a tragic end. In the mind of that stalker, it's not a fantasy, it's real. They will do anything it takes to meet this person and they will not stop at anything. In her mind, there was only one thing to do. Stalkers take lives, and they steal lives, and it can escalate to murder. May 1988, Manhattan. A woman, 36-year-old Margaret Mary Ray, is stopped at a toll booth on the west side of the city. She's driving a Porsche. She drives it through the Lincoln Tunnel, and she's actually stopped and arrested for non-payment of the fee. She did not have the amount of money you need to get through the tunnel, and police discovered that she was driving David Letterman's car. When the police pulled her over, she insisted that she was his wife and that her son in the back was David Letterman's child. I don't believe that she was trying to con the police officers. She genuinely believed it. He may be married to someone else, but he's not really married to the person. He really wants to be married to me. But how Margaret got to this point and what she was to do next was a long and tortuous story. One which was to put one of television's biggest stars at its center and destroy his stalker's life. She literally stopped at nothing to get his attention. David Letterman began his broadcasting life as a TV weatherman. He started in Indianapolis. He was a weatherman. He was an anchor. He was a children's show host. He was also a stand-up comedian. For over 20 years, he made his way to the very top of the American television industry. David Letterman got his big break on the Johnny Carson show. He considered Johnny Carson a friend through all of those years because he kept appearing on Johnny's show and he would do really, really well. The audiences gravitated toward him. Johnny Carson saw that the audiences loved him, so he kept asking David Letterman to come on the show. But in 1980, Johnny Carson was retiring and David Letterman was given the shaft. He thought that he was in line to replace Johnny Carson. But that did not happen. The gig was given to Jay Leno instead. But Letterman soon showed up on a rival network. He was always angry about not getting the one thing he wanted, which was The Tonight Show. So he competed with Jay Leno. And it was a huge, amazing, I mean, for many years, there was this huge competition between Leno and Letterman. It was amazing to watch. I think David Letterman is so successful because what you see on stage is the exact same person he is in real life. He's self-deprecating, he's funny, he's charming, and almost shy. At the peak of his career, he was making $35 million a year. He received 12 Emmys. Even today, if he's walking on the streets of New York or LA, he's gonna be stopped. People love him. He's just a beloved, a loved figure in America and will always be. By the 1980s, Letterman was one of TV's biggest stars. But celebrity can have a dark side. 
and for Letterman, it was a committed and obsessive stalker. Stalking begins in an individual's mind. It starts as a fantasy. The fantasy develops into an obsession, and then following the obsession, the individual acts on it. To really understand why people are drawn to celebrities as the ones they want to stalk, it's helpful to also think about why they wouldn't stalk other people. You wouldn't really stalk your neighbor because you already have access to them. They might not be as glamorous. They might not be as photogenic. However, a celebrity is glamorous. Uh, you have a lot of information about them out in, in the public. They see them on social media. They see them going to fancy restaurants, walking with their children down Fifth Avenue, seeing shows, having access to things that they want access to. And they think if they just become friends with that celebrity, that they could have that same exact life. When someone becomes so obsessed with this person that they call them, they follow them, they email them, they will do anything it takes to meet this person and they will not stop at anything. So the whole thing is more of a fantasy, but in the mind of that stalker, it's not a fantasy, it's real. And the person who began to see David Letterman in this context was Margaret Mary Ray, also known as Peggy. Margaret Mary Ray was born in Gracelake in Illinois in 1952. Uh, she was one of four children. She was a fairly middle-class family. Her parents were George and Loretta. For all accounts, she seemed to be you know, a, a model child in a beautiful family. She was uh, well-liked, popular, the light of people's eyes. She was very engaging and charismatic. By all accounts of those who knew her, her mother and her friends, they said she was a very bright, uh, articulate, intelligent, woman who actually could have been anything that she wanted to be. When she graduated from high school, she started going to nursing school and would have completed it except for the fact that she ended up getting married. She ended up marrying a man called Gary Johansson and having three kids with him. Very normal beginnings for Margaret. It appeared, however, that all was not well in the Ray family. Mental illness, specifically schizophrenia, had affected two of her siblings. Schizophrenia is the genetic disorder. It tends to run in families. She had, I believe, two brothers that were schizophrenic, and that's a really bad sign. And it's a major illness. Schizophrenia has to be taken as seriously as could possibly be. Her father, George, had suffered from schizophrenia from about mid-adolescence. He didn't take any medicine or receive any formal treatment for his schizophrenia, but he would have psychological breakdowns, and it seemed that he would treat it through his own coping through alcoholism and drinking, um, and that was his way of dealing with it. You know, these were all taking place at a time when mental health was not discussed in the public forum. People didn't talk about it. There was a stigma about getting medication, getting treatment, and seeking help. So people were afraid to accept and admit that they needed help. Schizophrenia usually manifests itself in early 20s. In her case, I think it was a little bit later. Unfortunately, Peggy's two brothers also suffered from schizophrenia. Her, her brother Bill drove his car full speed into a tree and then her brother, uh, David, who at only 22, poisoned himself with carbon monoxide. So they both died very young. For her family, who was very close-knit, to have this happen to several of her brothers, you can imagine the pain that must have caused for her because she had seen this happen not once, but twice, and knowing that the same thing could very well have happened to her too. Despite the potential for stability, Peggy continued to behave erratically. She had four children and she would cook hamburgers, but she wouldn't cook them all the way through and she would serve this to her children. She would go out in a summer day wearing a heavy winter coat. She would say, hey, I'm gonna make pancakes in one big blob as a pancake. She would take rides with truckers who she didn't know. She also would ramble on nonsensically about nothing for hours. She would talk to herself. She would behave in a bizarre fashion. She would drive her kids across country without telling anyone. When she came back, she really had no reason for why she had done it. It was just, that was where her mind went. So she had some awareness that she was uh, losing touch with reality, but at the same time, it's really hard for people experiencing these symptoms to be able to understand that they're losing control of their mind, that their mind is actually starting to, to fail them and and they don't have any control over it anymore. 
it led to her divorcing her husband and she actually lost custody of her children to uh, her first husband, Gary. So that was very sad. Not only did the disease take control, but she lost her family as a result. But Peggy attempted to rebuild her life. She did remarry and had one more child, but she struggled. She really struggled with mental health issues. But there was an additional condition to her illness lurking in the background. It is not common for people with schizophrenia to stalk. Schizophrenia has no direct relationship to stalking. What does is a very, very small subtype, which is called delusional erotomania. It's a delusional belief where an individual believes, really believes, that a person typically of higher social status is in love with them. It doesn't have to be a celebrity, but it could be a surgeon, it could be a, a judge, it could be, a, or, or just a wealthy businessman. And the belief is that that person is in love with them. They genuinely believe that they have this intense relationship or attachment with another. You know, for some, that can be a very comforting thing. But the problem is, if it brings somebody comfort, that's one thing. But then if they start to intrude um, significantly in another person's life, well, that's when it becomes very problematic. Not having any real anchor points, not having any real connections or people in her life. And that transient nature creates loneliness and isolation itself. So for Margaret, she would spend an evening watching David Letterman's show and for her, every time he came on, she felt some form of attachment to him. She saw him on TV and she then developed a delusion based on him, a delusional belief that he was in love with her. This is very, very typical of delusional erotomania. He fell in love and she believed deeply that he fell in love with her. She thought that he had this uh, infatuation with her and she was more of the victim of his uh, behaviors. You have to understand, this is not somebody who's just likes him, who's a fan of his, who wants to get to know him. No, this is somebody who is absolutely obsessed with him, fixated on him. Everything in her mind revolves around him. She wanted to have the life that he led, and she convinced herself that she deserved it. And so she would stop at nothing to get his attention and to be in his life. Margaret Mary Ray's pursuit of David Letterman, fueled by her erotomania, began to take on a whole new dimension. She felt like it was mutual, that he also loved her, and, and perhaps that was part of the reason why you know, when she would go visit him, she would trespass to go see him. She would bring cookies, she would bring forget-me-nots and flowers. Letterman's TV studio in Midtown Manhattan became a focus for her attention. She would turn up at the studio, she would um, write to him prolifically. Another time she left whiskey and candies or cookies in his foyer. But it was when she began to look to visit his home, the matter began to turn sinister. She was found sleeping on David Letterman's tennis court and left a book about mediation on the driveway. One time, David Letterman woke up and she was in the bedroom. Letterman did comment that it was more like odd than alarming. Someone breaking and entering into your property is scary. Even if it's a woman, this is scary, creepy stuff. You're in bed at night, be you male, female, and your doors go in or your windows go in or someone has a key and they let themselves in and they appear in your bedroom. That is a very frightening situation because you do not know whether that person intends you harm. In each of these cases, you can see that she was not trying to hurt him when she was going inside his property or inside his home. It was all about being close to him. Peggy went a stage further taking on a whole new persona at certain times. In one incident, she was at David Letterman's home. David was not there, but some painters working on the house were. She convinced those painters that she was David Letterman's wife, convinced them to give her a ride to the train station. Under the guise that she was Mrs. Letterman, but not to Margaret, though. It wasn't under the guise. It was that she genuinely was Mrs. Letterman. She sounded very believable. 
Margaret can come across as intelligent, articulate, because she is intelligent and articulate. If she's there on his property, who knows? Maybe it's his wife. And, and so they went along with it. And I think sometimes when people are lucid and they can explain things in a rational way, people don't really understand the significance of someone's mental health, that they still may be very unwell, that they may be able to be rational and lucid in some circumstances. There's no evidence that she wanted to hurt him. I don't think David Letterman ever thought she wanted to hurt him. She just wanted to be near him. She was, she was a big admirer, but it just went way too far. Peggy had completely convinced herself of the relationship. He's really in love with me, but he has to deny it publicly for his own personal reasons. He may be married to someone else, but he's not really married to the person. He really wants to be married to me. Keep in mind, this is not logical. This is not rational. This is delusional. She literally stopped at nothing to get his attention. But there was worse to come. Eventually, she took it to the next level where she took his Porsche. In 1988, Mary Ray was busted trying to get through the Lincoln Tunnel. She told the police when they came that David Letterman was good for the $3 to pay the toll, and eventually that's how they found out that she had stolen the car. Now how she got her hands on the keys, no one knows. Now you have to remember that Margaret was fully convinced she was David Letterman's wife, and she even told the, the police officers that Alex was their child. For her, the big victory, or the bigger victory, will be about being in David Letterman's Porsche. You know, she feels that she, she is his wife and she has a child by him, and this Porsche is reinforcing that, that really the three dollars probably is the last thing on her mind at, at that point. It didn't make a difference if she was breaking the law by breaking into his house or stealing his car. That's not important. The important thing is she's following her delusional beliefs. And that's why it's so potentially dangerous, not just for the celebrity like Letterman, but dangerous for herself as well. She could easily get killed or shot by someone who uh, involved in security for him. So you break into someone's house and he has a security person there, you're placing yourself at a tremendous risk. Despite all of this, Letterman declined to press charges, instead acknowledging Ray's illness. One of the things that supported Peggy's beliefs that David Letterman's feelings also were reciprocated towards her, that he had feelings back, was because he wouldn't press charges. And the fact that he, he didn't act like he was um, you know, very repulsed by her. In fact, he had this kind of understanding and a, a little bit of a soft spot for her because he didn't think she was dangerous or going to harm him. Nothing he would have said could have stopped any of this. What impact would it have on him? I don't know how it would have impacted him, but it can't be easy when you know somebody is repetitively breaking into your house, stealing your car. You, you, you know that this is an irrational person, a potentially dangerous person. So it had to have an impact. Many stalkers who believe that their victims are in love with them search for clues from them, signals that may validate their obsession. In a few instances, David Letterman made jokes about his stalker, Mary Ray, on the show. He had, he had this famous top 10 list that he, he would always do every single night. So right before he was leaving for CBS, he said he was going to have to change. This was one of the top 10 things he had to do before leaving. And he said he was going to have to change his address for that lady who keeps breaking into his house. And so that's quite an unusual thing to do, and he continued in that vein that his show was on earlier, therefore she'd have to uh, break into his house much earlier. And it was all sort of tongue-in-cheek stuff. David Letterman is a comedian, so I think he saw this incident that was happening to him as just something that happens to him. And, and comedians are like anthropologists in a way, and they include the things that are happening to them into their lives, and that, I think that's exactly what he was doing. Had he had to do it over, he probably wouldn't have done it. It's one of those things maybe a writer gave to him. It sounded funny at the time. It actually was pretty funny, um, but it can be potentially dangerous. You don't know how that's gonna set her off. 
One might wonder if Mary Ray found that very exciting and validating that he was recognizing her on his own TV show. And that might have been somewhat encouraging to her that, that he was noticing her. I think she thought that was a signal that a, maybe a wink and nod that I see you, I hear you, and I love you. And of course, that's not what David Letterman was saying. Well, he did make light of it. He never once named her in those jokes because he was very compassionate towards her illness and he didn't want to stigmatize her. He understood that schizophrenia was a very serious mental illness. I guess he decided he was better off making light of it and moving on with his life than getting bogged down. He handled it with compassion. He did not want Peggy arrested. He said it wouldn't be humane to arrest her. He felt sorry for her, really, and he wanted this to be handled in a gentle way. David Letterman's response to it is really unhelpful on a public, you know, massive platform. I spend my, uh, a lot of my time saying stalking is not a joke, it's not romantic, it is a crime. It's a serious crime and it ruins lives. Stalkers take lives and they steal lives and it can escalate to murder. So you have to take it seriously. Peggy's schizophrenic condition had begun to deteriorate. The symptoms of schizophrenia, the main symptoms, are hallucinations and delusions. Hallucinations are things like auditory hallucinations, hearing voices, visual hallucinations, seeing things. Delusions are a disorder of thought. So for example, if you think two and two is six, that's not a delusion, you're just incorrect. But if you think two and two is six because Martians have interfered with our number system, that's a delusion. She knew that she was schizophrenic. She knew it because her brothers were, she knew it because her father was, and she knew her own behaviors. But that doesn't mean that in the moment she has control and can recognize her behaviors as being due to her mental illness and then not do them. It just doesn't happen like that. With that unraveling, she decided to become homeless. And she was known to be homeless, but traveling around, being itinerant, she was creative because she always managed to get around the country and get to these places with little of any money. Truckers got to actually know her and she even worked out how to use citizen band radio, tuning into that. So yeah, truckers would sympathize with her and give her lifts where she needed to. Sometimes she'd even arrange to get lifts to these guys, but yeah, no one knew her where she would be day to day because she was leading a very erratic lifestyle. Her mother, you know, and indeed her children saw her unraveling, but she made a conscious choice that she wanted to hitchhike across America and she wanted to, um, you know, sofa surf and, and live in this particular way. So for them, you know, they just felt what more could they do if somebody refused, like Margaret, refused their help. There wasn't much that they were able to do about that. The sad truth is that she became one of America's statistics, homeless and mentally ill. This is one of the saddest things. Um, we see this relationship between mental illness and homelessness. It's hard for people with that level of mental illness to keep down jobs, even be able to pay their mortgage, pay their bills, do things that we would have to do every day in order to, to, to be able to survive in society. But it's interesting too that while she was going you know, homeless and going from shelter to shelter, Peggy had this larger than life persona where people were very drawn to her and they wanted to help her. And she was one of the more recognizable figures in the 1980s when she was going through all of this, particularly because she had this charisma that people were really drawn to. Once the illness took hold, she had a very rapid and a very severe deterioration. That doesn't happen in all cases, but it happened in her case. Between the late 1980s and early 1990s, Ray continued her random visits to Letterman's studio and home. Peggy taunted David Letterman over and over and over again. In fact, she was found trespassing eight times at his property. At what point would she want to spend time with David Letterman? Or maybe she wants to get into bed with David Letterman, whatever else. And you do tend to see escalation in those cases. Whenever someone comes onto your property and in your home, that's a very violating feeling, whether you're famous or not. So I think that that gets inside your head. You have to always wonder, when's that gonna happen again? Am I safe? Are my family and friends safe? Is my wife safe? 
but I wonder what those around him felt and whether she had left anything for him that was more sinister, um, whether he then may have felt more concerned for his safety or for his wife or for people in his immediate environment. I think that is something that you can't escape. Once someone invades your space, that is something you don't ever forget. But eventually, David Letterman felt that for the safety of his family, he had no option but to press charges. Even though he was ultimately pressing charges against her, she still saw it as this very unique time that she could be with him. Ray and Letterman now faced each other in court. One thing we see very frequently with stalkers is when they are able to get time, particularly in a public way, with the person that they're stalking, it's a big deal for them. They're in the same room together. They see each other. The victim knows who the stalker is. And so she knew she was gonna see Letterman. She'd be 20 feet from him in court. She got dressed up in peach-colored gloves. She was glowing as if she was on a date. This was her time to shine. Some people believe that she was actually relishing the attention, but that she didn't fully understand the magnitude of what she was doing and how wrong it was. Margaret Ray eventually served a total of 34 months in jail and psychiatric hospitals for stalking Letterman. Between uh, 1989 and 1994, Margaret was convicted of trespassing and related charges in five separate trials. Now, initially, she was deemed to be too mentally unwell to stand trial, so she ended up in a psychiatric ward. When you're in a facility, they can maintain the drug treatments and they can become quite effective. The problem is, is when people are under those drugs, they can often convince themselves that they don't need them anymore. And that's when all of this behavior can come flooding back. She did not like taking medication. She didn't like the side effects of the medication, weight gain. She would think illogically, and um, she just determined that the medicine wasn't right for her a good presentation, but obviously the woman on the other side of the lens is also uh, in needing of medication. Extreme lethargy, so she was very tired, um, there'd be weight gain, and there's also this sense of cloudiness. A lot of people who take schizophrenia medication feel like they're, they're in a haze. They're not quite present, they're just walking through life, but almost like a dream world. I would like to be able to get out and have a hot meal at the table and a pot of tea before dusk and um, uh, a, a promise to appear in your court, but not, I, I have a speaking engagement in Kentucky. Sometimes the thinking that they enjoyed when they were psychotic is reduced as a result of the medication. Another reason is a lot of people don't think that they're sick. Their lack of insight into their own illness is actually part of the illness. So it can be very, very difficult to treat patients like this, particularly if they're not cooperative, and many times they're not. Their lack of cooperation is part of their illness. Many times I have submitted commissary requests for the obligatory stamps and envelopes. The man in charge of commissary has not delivered my... But equally, you can have somebody who takes the medication for some time and then they believe that they're okay, and so they stop taking the meds. And, you know, again with Margaret, that happened later on in life, and it's then that they start to relapse. However, oftentimes they get released, and the side effects of those medicines or just the burden of refilling prescriptions, seeing a doctor routinely, these things are too much for that person to keep up with and they choose not to go keep their medications up and so they go back into that initial cycle of all the original behaviors that got them in jail or in that psychiatric facility to begin with. I think stalkers in general want attention and then this played out in the media, sort of adding fuel to her fire. This made her invigorated. This was great. She loved that her name was in the paper. Her name was in lights. People were talking about her and it just made her pursue her agenda even further. After her release, Peggy's attention shifted away from Letterman and to astronaut Story Musgrave. In many stalking cases, they switch obsessions. They go from one celebrity to another, from one person to another. 
In Margaret's case, she switched from David Letterman to a very famous astronaut. For some reason, and nobody really understands why, she became fixated on him. In the space world, Story was an icon. Story Musgrove was the second astronaut to fly on five space shuttles and six space flights. He was a very, very smart man. She saw him as brilliant, and here we go again. He's in love with her, he wants her. She went down to his place where he lived and all the rest of it. One of the first things that she did was send Story packages. Uh, they were anonymous. She didn't know that they were from her specifically. She started writing him letters asking, could she have an interview with him? She masqueraded as a reporter and set up an interview with him to talk about space travel and his life as an astronaut. In 1994, she conducted the interview at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. She got in, he invited her to the Space Center. They met face to face and he noticed something curious. She wasn't taking any notes. But Peggy, the stalker, had sent him packages. So when she left, he compared the address on the package to the letter requesting the interview and he put two and two together and realized that this was in fact his stalker. That happened and of course she was also stalking David Letterman at the same time, so she was a serial stalker. She next appears in Story Musgrave's life in 1997. In September, she showed up at his home in Osceola County in Florida. Peggy walks to his home, 30 miles from Orlando. And through the night, appears in his garden, turns on a hose. She's stripped naked, she sprays herself in water, and she's screaming his name. And that she would die for him, and that she loves him, and that he's a man of integrity and intelligence. So she's saying very coherent things at that point. For her, this is just, you know, rational behavior, but of course, for any outsider seeing this, this is not. But she didn't have complete control over her functions at this point. The only thing that she was really driven by was this obsession with Story Musgrave. The police are called and she's arrested for trespassing on his property. So again, were these dots joined up in terms of her behavior? She felt compelled to do it. And for people who are going through an extreme form of this psychosis, there is no rationality. They feel impulse and they act on it. Just like when we get hungry and we eat, it's the same thing for them. She was arrested for trespassing. She told the police that she was a co-author, that, that Mr. Mosgraf and, and her, they were writing a book together and she loved him and she would die for him. It's just another, a very, very irrational, attention-getting act that just speaks to how sick she was at that time. Peggy was truly devastated when the entire thing with Story Musgrave went south. That was that erotomania where she thinks there's a true relationship, that it's reciprocal, that he loves her, and she loved him back, of course. So when it became apparent to her that that wasn't the case, that he didn't love her, he did press charges against her, um, and very quickly, it was really devastating. It was becoming clear that Peggy was reaching a more distressing stage of her illness. She does go to another facility, and it's there that, you know, she becomes violent to other people. Certainly one of the officers who she kicked and another who she threw urine at. The propensity to become violent was very clear in Margaret Ray's case, and therefore, this case should have been taken seriously in terms of threat and risk, and perhaps, you know, David Letterman and Story Musgrave didn't know the full extent of her behavior, otherwise they, they would and, and should have been concerned for their safety and others around them. Margaret Mary Ray had achieved notoriety as the obsessive stalker of an international television celebrity and of a famous astronaut. Her stalking of David Letterman, while not malicious, could easily have become dangerous, even life-threatening. But by 1998, things had come to a head for her. 
She was released from the mental hospital and she couldn't get her footing in the real world. So she figured, let me go to Colorado. She felt that the world was laughing at her. She wanted to go back and change everything that happened, but of course she couldn't. So this was something that she really struggled with. People that um, have these very, very severe delusions, they're so tormented. Their life is such a total mess that she basically just couldn't take living anymore. She also knew being on her medication just made her incredibly unhappy. And ultimately, she made the, cho the choice. In her mind, there was only one thing to do, and her brothers had already done it. On October 5th, she was standing beside the tracks as a train on the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad approached. She did what she knew, and what she knew was to take her life. In her mind, stop the pain, the pain that she just, she had no control of. She laid down on the path of a coal train and waited. This is tragic, truly. I think she knew she was struggling. Uh, after 30 years of mental illness, she just couldn't take it anymore. And the way she kills herself speaks for itself to just how tormented she was. She was never really able to escape the schizophrenia and never really found peace. It's no fun living like Margaret Ray. In New York, Letterman reacted to the news of the death of the woman who had become a part of his existence for some time. David Letterman was obviously very impacted by this. He said this was a sad end to a confused life and that he was disappointed it was a terrible outcome. It was interesting that David Letterman actually made a statement about her committing um, suicide and that he said that you know, on one level she was a creative genius, but that he also uh, felt this kind of odd sense of loss. Uh, it was almost like losing a member, you know, a relative uh, in his family. You know, she always pretended to be a relative. She pretended to be his wife. So the fact that he said in his statement he thought of her as a relative, I think is significant. It's probably much more about his level of compassion of how he felt for her, knowing that she was mentally disordered and, and unwell, that he felt compassion for her and really wanted her to get help rather than anything else. Was she a little bit frightening and sometimes disturbing? Yes, but she was very resourceful and creative about how she got people to believe that she was his wife. Story Musgrave's response to Peggy's death might surprise some. He thought that she was a creative genius. She wasn't a bad person. She wasn't an attention-seeking person. She wasn't a person pulling pranks. She was sick. And I think when you understand it in context, it makes much more sense. One thing about Peggy, even though she had committed crimes, she trespassed, she had stolen a car, she had done things that were inappropriate, but these were not a negative, violent behaviors. These were not things that showed that she was a bad person. In fact, people really uh, loved Peggy. They thought she was wonderful, that she made this indelible mark upon them. And when she killed herself, that really impacted even the people that she stalked in such a, a, a huge way. They actually said it was like they lost a family member. Margaret Mary Ray ended her life aged just 46. Before her death, she wrote letters to her family. She knew that she was going to kill herself, and she actually sent them in the mail to her family, um, and each of these were very touching, well-written letters. These care packages started to arrive in friends' and family's houses. It was four notes, old photographs, one to her eldest son, Jacob, talking about how much she loved him and how he would go on to great things after she was gone. Told her mother that she, she was, this was her last day and that she was all traveled out and that she was going to have a quick death and that she wanted to die in the valley that she loved and that was in Colorado. At some point, she's conscious and she's lucid. 
She's, she feels there is a family connection, which is rather ironic because she spent her whole life running from it. And she left a, a very clear message to, to her son and, and to her mother, which is probably quite important to them. I'd imagine it was a very difficult situation for them in terms of not being able to reach her or help her, but even more so when she chose to end her own life. But perhaps they felt there was some element of peace that would come to her at last. It's so pu public, it's so out there, and her behavior is just so outrageous. It has to have a major impact, not only on Margaret's kids, but on all of her family members and friends as well. You know, what, what happens in some of these cases, particularly when they commit suicide, people look back at that and say, I knew she was disturbed, I knew she was sick, I knew she was, needed help, but I really didn't think she was that tormented. It's a good lesson, I think, for anybody, for all of us to, to realize that some of these people, this isn't prankster behavior. This is someone who's really, really mentally ill. We see a lot of tragedy come out of schizophrenia, but that being said, things have gotten a lot better in the two decades since when uh, Peggy killed herself um, because of her mental illness. Medicines have improved, treatments have improved, and even the stigma surrounding it has improved. So hopefully people now today will be more willing to seek treatments, um, seek better treatments, and ideally um, not take the same path that Peggy did in her life. Mm -hmm.